Welcome back to Twisted Skins Tech. Now recently a friend of mine was doing a house clearance at which he said the owners mentioned there was an old PC just lying around which they were just going to chuck away in the old scrapyard. So rather than chuck it away into the old scrapyard he actually decided to give it to myself to see if I could breathe some life into the old girl yet and possibly turn it into a gaming PC. Now having had a quick look at it it's probably about 10 years old and I don't think it's going to be particularly capable of much performance. But let's check out the specs in a bit more detail to see if I can upgrade it and maybe turn it into a gaming PC. Powering our system, we have a 250 watt power supply from FSP, which is not the most powerful, but they are known to be a good quality and it should provide enough power for anything we're going to be testing today. Next, we see a massive and also hideous Cooler Master CPU cooler which I'll be removing in a bit to find out which CPU it's dwarfing, as I imagine the thermal paste is pretty crusty by now. Unfortunately there is no RAM and after googling the Foxconn motherboard it appears to be running DDR2 so I'll stick two sticks of 2GB in. Next we see the graphics card which looks more like a display adapter, but more on that later. We're also missing a hard drive, but a quick visit to CEX should remedy that for a cheap price. So let's get that industrial looking cooler off to see what processing power we've got to play with. I did check out the listed CPUs for this Foxconn P4M8907 motherboard and the worst case scenario is a single core 1.6 GHz Intel Celeron 420 and the best case scenario is a dual core 2.9 GHz Intel Core 2 Duo Extreme X6800. I was kind of hoping that you guys would see me unveil which model but I think the camera needed to be a bit closer. Anyway, confirmed it's actually an Intel Core 2 Duo E4500 at 2.2 GHz. I'm just glad it wasn't a single core CPU. Under closer inspection, the graphics card is actually an Nvidia 8400 GS, which comes under the 80 nanometer Tesla architecture. This came with a whopping 16 shader units, 256 megabytes of DDR2 memory, and a 64 bit memory bus, and to be honest, was a pretty terrible card even in 2007. If we're to stand any chance of playing games, this has to go. For a suitable replacement, I found this Sapphire R7250, which I picked up for £30 from CEX. This comes in with 384 stream processors, 1GB of GDDR5 RAM, and 128-bit memory bus. The clock speed registers at 800MHz, and the memory is running at 1150MHz so we should be able to game at at least 720p settings. All that's left now is to power this beast on and oh dear, this machine did not even post. As you can see both the CPU and GPU fans are spinning but we never even got into the BIOS. So after the last week of changing power supplies and trying many different troubleshooting methods I finally gave up and declared the motherboard as dead. Not exactly the result I was hoping for or expecting. But rather than finish the video here, I thought you guys might like to see how the R7250 games in some interesting older and newer titles. So I hooked her up to the £400 PC build I did a few weeks ago, which includes the Intel i7-2600 and 8GB of DDR3 RAM to make sure there's no bottlenecks and ran the benchmark at least three times and averaged the results. Up first we have the 2016 release Bioshock Remastered, this ran surprisingly well at 1080p with all the settings maxed out, even though the recommended specs suggest either a Radeon HD 7970 or Nvidia GTX 770. In this environment we returned an average of 67 FPS, 1% lows hit 46 and 0.1% lows only dipped to 36 frames per second. A truly playable experience with this £30 graphics card. Those of you with a more competitive streak will be pleased to hear that the popular CSGO ran really well on this card as well. At 1080p resolution, I found the medium settings to be the best compromise for frame rate versus visuals. Under these conditions, the R7250 gave us an average of 108 FPS, 1% lows came in at 79, and the 0.1% lows came in at 61 FPS. So you'll have no trouble dominating, or in my case, being dominated in this title. Up next, we have the glorious visuals of Ori and the Blind Forest, I like to include this for those of you who enjoy more underground indie titles. So at 1080p maximum settings, the R7250 gave us an average of 81 FPS, 99% of the time it stayed above 41 FPS, 
and the 0.1% lows did occasionally hit 26 FPS. There wasn't any stutter though, but I did feel like there was some slowdown when there was a lot of special effects going on. Maybe the VRAM was hitting its limit. Those of you who enjoy open world RPGs, we have the original Skyrim up next. I did try Skyrim SE on this card, but I didn't find this game particularly playable even at 900p low settings. Rather than drop to 720p, I opted for the original Skyrim where 900p high settings gave us a nice balance of good looking game with a decent frame rate. Here the Radeon checked in an average of 64fps with the 1% lows hitting 39 and 0.1% lows of 26. There was no noticeable slowdown or stutter in this title. Back to some first person shooter action, we have Borderlands 2 which was a very smooth experience on this card. All three test runs returned almost identical results. I chose 900p again and medium settings for the best experience of visuals versus frame rate. Here the R7 250 clocked in an average of 44 FPS, 99% of the time it stayed above 36 FPS and the 0.1% lows only dipped to 34 FPS, a very playable experience. So now we move on to some newer titles that this card probably shouldn't even be trying to play. As such, all these titles had to be dropped to 720p. With that in mind, at 720p medium settings we have Fallout 4, which actually looked a lot better than I thought it would. This time the Radium returned us an average of 43 FPS, it stayed above 31 FPS 99% of the time, and occasionally dipped to 23 FPS when things got pretty hectic. Even so, I would have no trouble playing this title with this card. Up next we have Prey 2017, and this was a pretty tough title for this card to run, even though I know this game is well optimised for older hardware. I had to drop to 720p low settings, which I'll be honest looked rather underwhelming, and it still didn't perform great. I ran the benchmark 6 times in total to make sure that you guys got accurate results on this, and in this instance the R7 250 averaged 63fps and stayed above 40fps 99% of the time. The problem comes at the 0.1% lows, which come in at 17fps, which accounts for the micro stutter I was experiencing as the action intensified. I would not recommend playing this title with this card if you enjoy a smooth experience. Finally we have the biggest surprise of the day, Wolfenstein 2 The New Colossus. This was actually very playable at 720p settings, probably due to the Vulcan support. I played through an entire level with some pretty big explosions and intense gunfights, and found absolutely no stutter or slowdown. This performance was reflected with an average of 44fps, 1% lows of 33 and 0.1% lows coming at 26fps. I was fully immersed in this title, so no problems here. In conclusion, it's a shame that we were not able to get the system up and running, but it was probably being taken to the scrapyard for a reason. Don't worry though guys, I have a budget build under £100 coming soon. The good news is that those of you looking to play some older games at 900p medium settings could certainly do worse than the R7 250 for £20 to £30. If you're looking to play some newer titles though, you will more than likely have to drop to 720p low settings, and even then there's no guarantee that you will not encounter stutter as exhibited in Prey 2017. Ultimately though, you'll probably want a better graphics card with something like an R9 270X or GTX 750Ti, which both come in around the £60 mark. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a like. If you haven't done so already, consider subscribing where I'll be doing more content like this. Thanks for watching, I'll catch you guys in the next episode.